Welcome to the edge of the world. You have 21 students in your class. Miranda Atatahak. Shani Ignak Ignak Palga. Ignak Palga. Sorry. <laughs> Jason Midovic. He's not coming back. Another night out in the call. I put a word to my neck as I froze. My team really with it, get hit it, get with it. No limit when I get back under the road. No These kids, they need an outlet to get involved in something besides this damn night culture. Sports. Who the hell are you to say what we need? <laughs> oh. Hey, bud, you want to come check out lacrosse Wednesday after school? Flyers won't work. You got to show respect, eh? You guys like sports, huh? I don't like to run. You know, I watched the film and then I read up on the make, you know, the story of how you made the film. And it almost feels like, and I don't want to minimize the, the uh, content of the film, but making the film was almost parallel to some of the story in, in itself. So, did it feel like that for you when you were making it? Definitely, yeah. I, I related a lot uh, more to Russ Shepard after, after I made it. I even called him once I was having a kind of breakdown. Um, a bunch of kids were coming to me in the evenings and knocking on my door and wanting to share some of their trauma. And as I got closer to them, I started to feel like, wait a second, I'm just a filmmaker. I am not a therapist. I don't know how to um, hold space in this way and be respectful. Right. And so I called Russ and I said, I don't know what to do. And he <laughs> said, it's not about you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably a good way to approach it, I would guess. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I learned, um, definitely learned a lot and it did feel, did feel a bit parallel. Yeah. 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 Um, and so, so it, it took like, was it almost 10 years to make the film? It was from the very beginning. And when I started out making the movie, I was a producer on the film, but right. I wasn't directing. Um, Graham Yost was attached to direct. And then right. he called me and he loved developing it. And I loved working with him, but he ended up getting um, justified greenlit. He was the showrunner of that TV series for FX. And so right. he... Uh, he just got really busy and he said he just wasn't going to be available to direct it. But as he sort of handed it back to me, he said, um, but you know, DePontier, you should direct it. And I said, <laughs> what? You're crazy. I've never directed. I'm a producer. Right. And he said, yeah, but you've been up there now. You've spent the time, you know, you know, the kids in the community so well. And he just sort of encouraged me. So I can thank Graham Yost for my directorial debut. Yes. And so you end up directing a film for the first time up in the Arctic with untrained actors and dogs and children, the whole ball of wax. Uh, how did you manage to pull that off? I mean, it must have been a yes, struggle. And, and weather oh, and, and stunts weather. and fight sports, basically everything you do not want in your first uh, movie. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know. How, <laughs> I can tell you that that it was such a journey um, on a practical level and then on an emotional level. Um, and I'm super grateful to just my partners on it. I had extraordinary, amazing partners. I, I thought I was making a sports drama when right. I started out um, developing this movie and then you know, ended up in in Kugluktuk Nunavut in an indigenous um, um, Inuit community for the first time and realized there would be no way to tell this story properly or respectfully without finding indigenous partners. So very right. early on, I did get um, these two amazing Inuit co-producers and through them, um, we ended up building uh, you know, a much bigger fabric beyond the film, training, mentorships, uh, mental health support, um, just a lot of, um, and, you know, I learned a ton about, um, about the indigenous, um, situation in Canada. So right. I, I really have to thank them, um, them for helping me through it. And just on a practical level, you know, you can't be in a small indigenous community making a movie without, um, a lot of support and help and having to constantly navigate locations and people in a way that you yep. can't just barrel through it the way you do in in a big city so yeah, yeah. who are you know that's used to a film crew being around 
Right, right. And then on top of all that, of course, you're dealing with the topic of suicide, especially teen suicide, which is a major part of the film. And it's a very big issue here in New Zealand. I don't know if anybody's aware of that, but we have a big problem with that. So um, I assume, you know, that, that people will connect, make that connection, even though we're on opposite sides of the planet from you. And Well, I actually, I made a movie in New Zealand uh, 31 years ago. Really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. I'm, I'm dating myself now. And um, <laughs> it was the first film I made out of Canada and I absolutely loved it. And actually one of the crew members was Maori and he, I, we just became buddies. He worked on the camera department and he taught me a whole, a bunch of Maori culture. Right. And I read the bone people. And, and in fact, I learned more about uh, the sort of, you know, colonization and the issues of how Maori people are affected. Um, I learned more about New Zealand indigenous population than I ever knew about Canadian, what was going on in Canada. Right. Um, so it's interesting to kind of come full circle and end up learning, uh, you know, learning a, a, a lot about what, you know, all the mistakes Canada made. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, nobody's perfect. That's for sure. <laughs> as far as that goes, I, I think yeah. everyone struggles to deal with it in their own way. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so, uh, it must have presented some unique challenges as far as actually making the film when you're dealing with that subject matter and some of the same people that are probably affected by some of these things. So how did you kind of navigate yourself through that? Well, again, I luckily and fortunately had the right um, indigenous partners to kind of help me know how to navigate that properly. But I think a number of the things um, that we we did, first of all, we cast locally um, in the north. We we weren't hiring indigenous people from the south. We definitely hired young actors who are from the same Arctic communities um, that are similar to the community where the story takes place. So a lot of the young actors live, breathe, and deal with the same issues that their the characters they're portraying deal with. Sure. You know. Yeah high suicide rates in their communities, um, a lot of domestic violence and um, drug and al alcohol issues. Again, not their fault, but all, all stemming from, from colonization. So, um, so basically, uh, you know, that, that made it more authentic and made it more um, connected because they could be those actors I worked with could be my teacher and right. guide to how to deal with um, with working with them. And, yeah. and, and a lot of, I think as a director, you're, usually you're really being dictatorish and you're demanding and you're kind of controlling yeah. everyone. In this case, there was a lot more give and take and dialogue and sensitivity. So if a kid needed more time to recover from a sensitive scene, then that was it. We shut down and let the actors be the center of it. We right. also made sure we had mental health workers who read the scripts, um, the drafts of the screenplay, weighed in. And then we had mental health workers on call. So if any actor was being sort of triggered and needed that support. In the end, the actors that we hired, we cast all over the Arctic Circle um, and, and 600 kids um, you know, auditioned and then we brought them to the Eastern Arctic and we did a series of workshops. And, and during those workshops, um, we also sort of saw who are the kids that were loving the acting and, and it uh -huh. was therapy for them to be able to release their emotions and who were the kids that, that really weren't ready to express that and that it, was, it, it wasn't healthy for them. So I think sometimes acting can be incredibly therapeutic and positive. And for all the young actors that we hired, it was that for them. Were you struggling? Because you mentioned right at the beginning of the interview that you thought you were just making a sports film, you know, about this team. Did you have to kind of veer away from those cliches? Because that film has been made many times before, you know, the putting them all together and raising up to the top. So were you thinking about right. that? Yeah. I mean, I happen to love um, sports films. Like I, I, I am a fan of that genre. 
Um, and, but yeah, you, you, you know, obviously it's been done a lot, so you don't want to do it in a way that, that feels derivative or something we've seen before. Right. Um, I think the good thing about this film was very much one of the things that was beneficial in the program. Um, the Grizzlies team that got started, the teacher made sure that it was going to be lasting by giving the kids, um, the, the reins to lead, to run the program, to fundraise, to really run it for themselves so that when he was gone, it, it would carry on. And it was really the kids who, who had the agency and to sort of own it and run it themselves. Well, let's move on to a different subject on the film, because as okay. you can probably see, I'm a music fan. I've got a few records behind me. And yeah, I see that. I, I enjoyed the music in the film was interesting as well. I saw there, there was like a Buffy St. Marie song in there somewhere. And uh, it ends with a beautiful song by Kelly Frazier. And so did you have much to do with that part of the, the filmmaking? Yes. I mean, music is a love of mine. And um, it was really important that we, that we use primarily, um, a, a, you know, as much um, Inuit music specifically, because right. there's more First Nations and Indigenous um, music that was already out there that had been recorded, but we really wanted to make sure that the Inuit uh, musicians were featured in the film. And one of the problems is there isn't a huge industry, not because there's not a lot of talent, but, but a lot of the musicians live in these tiny little remote flying right, communities right. in the Arctic. It's, there's not recording studios. It's expensive to get to a city with a recording studio. Yep. Um, so I tasked our um, music supervisor with finding these young rappers across the Arctic. So she went onto YouTube and identified four of them. Yeah. And then we sent pieces of the movie up to them. They well, you got to love their YouTube rap. these days, right? I mean, right. They it's wrote just... their rap against picture and then we flew them to Toronto and we brought in the engineer for Drake in the weekend and they, <laughs> and they, when we made their, that music, I, I have to say like, I really love filmmaking, but just in a little way for a moment, I thought, Oh my, this is like being a music mogul is really fun to be in a studio and, and see yeah, yeah. music yeah. come to life that wouldn't have otherwise existed. That's very and cool. And then of course, yeah like Buffy and um, the late, amazing, great Kelly Fraser, um, who tragically died last year, but she, all these amazing artists that I, yeah. I just hope the world learns about and knows yeah, about. Yeah. There's, there's, there are uh, those young, in fact, one of the songs that we made then won the Canadian Screen Award for best song, which is like our Oscar last year. Yeah. That was so exciting. For That's very cool. Artists. Now I gotta, I gotta imagine that I know that you showed the film to a lot of the folks up in North, in the Arctic area before it kind of was in general release. What was there? Were you worried about how they were going to react to it? And petrified. I yeah. mean, yeah, that was the audience that that mattered the most to me, and I, guess, yeah. um, I was really scared. Yeah, and and I the, the the audience that was the most important was was screening it for the real Grizzlies kids um, in yeah. Kuklatuk to fly yeah. the movie there as soon as. The, the first place we were, we screened the film was we got into TIFF to the Toronto Film Festival. And so I knew it was a whole bunch of people were gonna see it in a fancy theater in Toronto with a red carpet. And so yeah. it was really important for the, the actual Grizzlies kids, the film is based on to see it first. So I flew with one of my co-producers, Stacy, up to the Arctic and we screened it and we, pl we pressed play and then we left the room and freaked out. Um, <laughs> but the, they cried and they loved it and they felt like it was so really quite accurate. And also um, it, it I think that what I'm proud of in the film is we didn't shy away from the real issues, but I think we, we, as, as my indigenous co-producers say, you also don't want tragic porn. There's been right. a lot of that. And, right. Right. You know, in praying indigenous communities. And so I think it was like finding that exact balance yeah. And um, and then we screened the film. We raised a quarter of a million dollars and flew to a whole bunch of remote indigenous communities that don't even have movie theaters so that young people could see versions of themselves. You know, yeah, yeah. there's not there has a lot of in, in North America, certainly movies where the stars are yep. awesome young indigenous heroes. And yeah, yeah. so it, we wanted that 
community to see themselves on a big right. screen. So since the, the book and the movie were made a while ago and it's, have, have things changed? Do you see a difference in that culture now? I mean, really it's sort of speak to an indigenous person. And I think that they would say, um, uh, uh, um, you know, reconciliation is dead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, was was defeated in Walking Eagle News. I think. Listen, there's awareness. Um, there, the conversations have started. There are baby steps. There's a long way to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's better than it was ten years ago. I well, think awareness is. If you're not talking about what the problems are, then and 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 enough population don't know and care, um, then. And change doesn't happen, but there's still, listen, it's this, we're talking about systemic issues over generations um, and, and that's going to take time. I have awesome hope though. I have to say like working on this film, for instance, one of the young actors on a lamb said before making the movie, she had a lot of internalized racism. She hated herself as an indigenous woman. The examples she saw were murdered or missing indigenous women was, was the image she had of a native Canadian woman in her head. Right, right. And she said in making the film brought her such pride of culture. She's a proud in Nook. She wants to fight for indigenous rights. So I'm, I think that um, I have hope in this generation that's coming up yeah. that you know, we who can to give space to listen to indigenous voices. Um, and um, yeah, and there's, there's, there's a lot of really smart, really exciting young people that are, that are coming up. Very cool. So now do you think of yourself as a film director? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think that, uh, uh, yeah, you know, I'm as, I'm as human and, and, you know, humble and vulnerable as and messy as every other human, I guess. Very good. Well, thank you for talking to me about it. And thanks for making the film. I hope, I think it's going to have a big impact down here as well. So uh, we'll see how it does. Oh, I really hope so. I'm, I'm so jealous your movie theaters are open and I'm glad people are going to get to see it on the big screen. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, come down and make a couple more movies when you get a chance. I like that. <laughs> um, pleasure to meet you. You too. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.